Un canapé. Acht Leute. Ein Frage. A House Parliament is a get-together of four to eight people who discuss and answer a European question. Everybody can sign up as a host and invite his own friends to this discussion round. Pulse of Europe will provide all the material that is needed. Home parliaments are not simply a means to stimulate discussion and further interest in European politics. The outcome of these discussions will be passed on to politicians who have committed themselves to the project and are interested to know the opinion of the people on the streets. Home parliaments are a method to enhance civic engagement in processes of political decision making. Pulse of Europe wants to use this method to establish a line of communication between people's living rooms and Brussels. With this project, Pulse of Europe wants to further the expansion and influence of a European civil society. Welcome to the first webinar about the European Home Parliaments. Today, for the first time, we are discussing the results of our citizen debates with politicians across Europe. And this is urgently needed. Because 2021 will be an important year for Europe. The old year ended with the, human, with the German <laughs> EU Council Presidency and now the new one lies ahead of us. Central topics are on the agenda, overcoming the corona crisis, the next steps for the new Green Deal, the question of how Europe will deal with immigration and the future, how it will handle conflicts about the rule of law, the question of whether and how it intends to move from an economic union to a social union. What do citizens of this union want? And how can politics and citizens come into better exchange in order to find a path together for the future of Europe? So I say, dear citizens, hello Europe. We are happy that you are here. We are Peter, Peter, Jan, please raise your hand, and Anja, and guide you through the webinar today. With the European Home Parliament, Pulse of Europe wants to stimulate the dialogue between politics and Europeans. We are convinced that a lively Europe needs citizens who are committed to Europe, who join the discussion, who are engaged, who like to participate for Europe. And it needs politicians, um, the other way around, who listen and take the results of this dialogue, dialogue to the parliaments. That's why we developed the European Home Parliaments in 2018, together with the researchers of the Institute Democracy International. The idea was simple. Four to eight Europeans meet at home, at the kitchen table, in the garden, park or cafe, to discuss central European political issues. For that, we developed a method for structured discussions with a clear set of rules, clear questions and a clear vote at the end of the debate, similar to Parliament. You know that, I think, most of you have taken part in such a home Parliament already. So more than a thousand people spoke in the first two rounds about topics such as European foreign policy, a European unemployment fund or a, a CO2 tax. Peter, um, how many took part in the third round we just had in autumn? Yeah, we went one better. In autumn 2020, 1,200 people from all corners of Europe discussed the question, should the EU move towards more mutual solidarity? They came from more countries than ever before. Europeans from 12 countries, from Bulgaria to Poland, from Italy to France, from Sweden to Portugal, and Spain were also there. And they met not only on site, but also virtually. 500 Europeans discussed via Zoom, and often across countries. 
So Belgians and Germans and Poles, for example, were sitting together around a virtual kitchen table. Forced by the Corona pandemic, the video house parliaments became a motor of the European public sphere. And suddenly it really was a lively European, European citizens talk. So well, thank you, Peter. Next, I would like to shortly welcome Stephanie Hartung um, from the Pulse of Europe board in Frankfurt. Stephanie, um, Steffi, why are the home parliaments important for Pulse of Europe? Um, you're muted. You're muted, Steffi. Please unmute your microphone. I'm sorry, I intended to be mute as long as possible, not to interfere with you. Well, hello, good evening and a very, very warm welcome in the name of all board members of Pulse of Europe to everybody here tonight. Well, why are the European Home Parliaments, why is this special dialogue project so important, so meaningful for our citizens movement? Um, from the very beginning of Pulse of Europe in January 2017, we aimed at standing up for the European idea and make people seen and heard that believe therein. And it's certainly worth mentioning one more time in these very days that it was in fact for two main reasons why Pulse of Europe was born. The Brexit votum in mid-2016 uh, and the election of uh, US President Trump shortly thereafter both events accompanied uh, by the outlook on parliamentary elections in the Netherlands, France and Germany and expected notable gains on the extreme right uh, of the party spectrum. And while well, today, exactly four years later, the Brexit has just become reality, still unbelievable but true. And although President Trump hopefully has already started packing suitcases, um, the harm that has been done in the past couple of years, not only to the US democracy, but also to a significant number of, democ um, of um, um, democratic systems right within the European Union, um, I think shows that it's more important today than ever to get engaged in preserving the many achievements of the EU um, and make it resilient for the future. So, how else might we otherwise cope with e.g. the corona crisis or other global challenges such as the fight, you spoke about it already, against climate control or um, uh, social inequality. So we at Parts of Europe strongly believe that all European citizens, as a matter of course, must take part in Brussels' day-to-day -day business, political events, and that the citizens' opinion regularly needs to find its way into the uh, political opinion forming processes. And long before the European Commission actually announced that there should be a European wide conference on the future of Europe, Pulse of Europe had already started back in 2018 to connect via the European Home Parliaments, European citizens and political decision makers from Brussels. And so to arrange for a direct dialogue on substantial European topics. And as we are all very excited to now enter this very dialogue of the evening on the future of European solidarity, um, let me just finish off by saying thanks to all of you who care about the European Union and take an active part in developing its future. Um, we trust to see you participating also in future rounds of the European Home Parliament and so support this project. Um, hoping that it will become an indispensable element, not only in the upcoming conference on the future of Europe, but hopefully in Brussels political daily routines. <laughs> and as we used to say here, let's be the pulse of Europe. So thanks again and back to you, Anna and Peter. Thank you, Steffi. Yeah, um, that's right. We are very happy that we have such a huge response from citizens. Uh, it was tremendous, but also from politicians. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen um, supports the, U uh, the European Home Parliaments and 30 European politicians participate. I think it's an enormous number. This shows how important the project has already become for democracy in Europe, right, Peter? Yes, and in fact, the cooperation with politicians is the second highest highlight uh, of our project. The results of the citizens' discussions do not fizzle out in an empty space. 
but are taken directly into politics. Politicians take a stand and answer the citizens' questions directly. How do they see the citizens' positions? What do they want to implement? And how? What opportunities and barriers do they see in the daily business of politics in the EU? All these questions were in the center of the discussions among the citizens. And in the upcoming weeks, 10 politicians will be taking a stand on citizens' wishes. They come from five countries and belong to five parties in the European Parliament, from the Progressive Alliance of Social De Democrats, s and um, to the Liberals of Renew Europe, the Conservative, APP, and the United European Left, to the Greens. For the first time, time, citizens and politicians discuss in our webinar across national borders. We never had it before. And today, more than tonight, I say, <laughs> um, more than um, 80, I think, yes, 82 citizens from different countries are joining us. Uh, we look forward to your questions for politicians. Thank you that you are with us, dear participants. So today, the European Social Democrats will kick off with 145 seats. They are the second strongest party in the EP. I would like to welcome Katerina Bali and Lukas Kohut. Welcome. Katerina Bali has a doctorate in law, is a Social Democrat and member of the European Parliament for the s and since July 2019. From 2017 to 2019, she was Federal Minister for Family Affairs and then Federal Minister of Justice in Germany. Before in 2019, she ran in the European elections. Bali's story is intertwined with Europe like few others. She is the daughter of a British journalist and a German doctor, studied in Cologne and Paris, is married to a Dutchman, lives at the border of four European countries near Trier, has two children with grandparents from four European countries and two nationalities herself. Katerina Bali is vice president of the EP, responsible among other things for information policy and relations with the press and citizens. She is a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Welcome, Ms. Bali. Thank you very much. Pleasure <laughs> to be here. <laughs> uh, one short question uh, to warm up a bit. How does it feel to change um, national politics with, with a job in the European sphere? Is it very different? It is very different indeed. Um, I mean, I used to be, because being a minister, already in the council, um, participating uh, there. So, so I knew how it works also in practice, not only in theory, but the atmosphere is very different. It is very, of course, international. You have all these languages, you have all these mentalities, you have all these traditions, also judicial, pol political traditions. So it's a lot more diverse. Um, it's younger, it's more female, um, and it's yeah, a bit fine. more behind the scenes. That is also good. The press is not so, you know, you can you can mingle more between the groups. That is also a very very nice part of it. And maybe it's it's more open because you are not you you change the uh, national perspective to the with the um, uh, European perspective a bit. Of course, I mean you have to be a convinced European at least if you want to be. I mean, we also have people in the parliament who are not convinced Europeans, uh, unfortunately, but to really do a European job, you have to be a convinced European to enter the European parliament in yes. the first place. But of course, in the political groups, you're not by yourself. You have to work with Portuguese social democrats as well as with Finnish, and they don't always have the same opinion, which is interesting too. Okay, thank you. We're looking forward to talking to you. So, Lukasz Kohut comes from Poland and studied politics. He is an entrepreneur, photographer, activist, and entered the European Parliament in 2019 as the leading candidate of the progressive pro-European party Rioshna, I hope I got it right, for the Social Democrats. 
He is also closely intertwined with Europe, having studied not only in Katowice, but also in Warsaw, Finland, as part of uh, um, an Erasmus program. He has lived in Norway and in the Czech um, Republic and spe speaks five European languages fluently, Polish, English, Norwegian, Czech, and uh, the Schlesian dialect, I read. <laughs> in 2017, Kohut um, protested as an activist against Polish President Andrzej Duda and worked at the Institute of uh, Democratic Thought with social democratic thought leader Robert Diedron. In the European Parliament, he is part of the um, Industry Committee and the Civil, Civil Liberties Committee. Welcome, Mr. Kohut. Good evening, Europe. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to take part in this uh, webinar. Uh, it is indeed uh, crucial that uh, politicians and citizens uh, are in close uh, dialogue. Uh, I'm also very happy to take part in this uh, webinar alongside my SND colleague, uh, Katarina Barley, uh, with whom I have had the pleasure to cooperate uh, during uh, last months in, uh, in the Libe Committee. Uh, and I have to add that I'm uh, representing uh, probably the most pro-European uh, federalist generation uh, of people uh, born in Poland in the 80s. Um, we remember the end of the communist times in Poland um, and also the transformation period uh, very well. And for the whole generation and our uh, predecessors, our parents, our grandparents, uh, being a member of the European uh, Union and NATO, uh, was a dream, um, a main political aim um, for all. And it was also my dream from, from high school to become a member of the uh, European uh, Parliament representing my uh, region, Silesia, here in Brussels and uh, in Strasbourg. Oh, great, uh, Mr. Kohut. Then you are the perfect counterpart to, to talk with uh, this evening. Thank you for being here. Um, it's um, interesting, Polish citizens, uh, so far as I've, I have read, seem to be divided. Half are Eurosceptic and the other half um, is uh, pro-Europe. How does it feel for you as a Polish politician to represent your country in Brussels? Well, there was a, there was a poll uh, in November about uh, uh, staying in the European Union or all exit. And uh, believe me, 87% of, 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 of polls uh, uh, said that they want to uh, remain in the European Union. So I don't think that, that the polls are Eurosceptic. Of course, the Polish government is, is Eurosceptic, mm -hmm. but this is another, um, another case. And I'm, all, I'm representing the people who are pro-European, who are uh, pro-federalist. Uh, and that's why maybe I'm also a member of the European Parliament, because they voted for me because they knew that I'm a, a federal, the European Federalist from Silesia. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to, have to add that my, that my region, Silesia, is very uh, pro-European. Uh, in, uh, in 2003, when we had the access referendum, 85% uh, uh, of people vote for, uh, uh, for the, for the mem membership in the European um, Union. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you both for coming today. One question in the beginning to both of you. Uh, why is a dialogue format, uh, dialogue platform like the House Parliaments, um, important and interesting for you as politicians? Go ahead, Mr. Cohen. Or Ms. Oh. Ollie. <laughs> okay. Let's. Let's start. With, okay, thank you. Let's let's start with the statement uh, that uh, a dialogue with citizens uh, is always important and uh, interesting. Uh, after all, being members of the European Parliament, uh, we re represent the European public, uh, and it would not be absurd if we didn't engage uh, in dialogue uh, with those uh, whom we re represent. Uh, the House Parliament format uh, is even more interesting because uh, it provides. Uh, for a direct connection with uh, Europeans. Um, I think in the times of pandemia, uh, that is especially precious. Uh, I have to add that uh, because of social media times, uh, I'm in touch with my people all the time uh, from the beginning of my, of my man mandate uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, it, is very, uh, it is very important. Uh, I'm posting summary of the, of the week uh, 
uh, on my on my Facebook uh, and a lot of other information from the European Parliament and have to say that my followers enjoy it a lot um, and I think there there was a lack of knowledge about the EU structure and uh, and the work of European institution in my region uh, okay. before. Yeah, that's why we just it's necessary to discuss as well. Ms. Bali, would you like to add something? Um, well, I totally agree with what Lucas said. I mean, we as as the Parliament, we are the the people the the institution that is directly elected by the people. So so that's why we, in the very first place, um, have the obligation and I would say the pleasure to be especially engaged in in the dialogue with with citizens and and as Lucas also mentioned it, it is it is I mean it is a vital part of, of being a parlam parliamentarian and uh, for me it is one of the favorite parts um, already when I was member of the German parliament we did that a lot um, and now in times of pandemia it is more difficult but as Lucas said social media wise it is possible but of course um, the, the the special part about uh, about the ho uh, home parliaments is is that we now have, have the possibility of speaking with people all over Europe. And that is more yeah. difficult if you do it um, as an, as a, of course we are all European parliamentarians, but we are elected from our national uh, population. So, so mm -hmm. I, I really love it because um, it's always been talked about the Brussels bubble. Um, I don't think that, I think it is a bit exaggerated because we are all human beings and we have families and we have, friends and we have neighbors uh, at home in our home countries and we have surroundings we are members of sports clubs or whatever so so we we are just normal people more or less but of course um to to have the possibility of people who 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 want to give a specific message to, to politicians it is very very important to open these ways and also to give immediate feedback and that is why I re always enjoy this kind of okay. format and I'm always ready to do it as as if you're in need of a politician I'm always there. <laughs> Great so let's start let's start the discussion. Two politicians more than uh, no nearly 100 citizens quite a lot I guess but we still want to dare a dialogue because as a grassroots movement part of Europe wants to bring citizens and de decision makers together at eye level. Therefore, there will be no long statements tonight, but quick dialogue. We will lead through the main, uh, I will lead through the main voting results, ask our political guests about it, and then I'll open up the discussion quickly to you. Peter, could you explain our agenda? Yes, and actually you have two possibilities to make yourself heard, your voice heard. The first one is write your questions into the chat. And I'm seeing this is happening right now um, already. And then Jan will bundle these questions and we come back to them later. I will read them out. And if you want to ask a question via video, you are more than welcome. This is also possible. Uh, so please write then the topic you want to chat about into um, here, into the, the box, and then make a additional statement and and put the word live question uh, in front of your statement so we know that you want to talk about this specific thing this specific question live in a video way yeah so just add live question and we know you want to talk not just in 2d but in 3d and four colors yeah <laughs> and uh, so we, we will try to consider as many people as possible we can't bring everyone in but we try to do as uh, much as possible and Jan will organize the entry of these people who said they wanted to talk with us. So please keep the questions a bit short. Um, we also have to translate them in parts. So the longer the questions is, the, uh, the longer the questions, the harder it's, it is. So short and crispy, and then we go for it. Um, and yeah, we'd like to make you uh, make a, you to make a statement of round about one minute not more so, so not, not not really like five minutes or ten minutes because that would mean the others can't speak so just one minute make your point and you will be heard okay let's try together and see if it works ready so let's come to the first um, question we asked in uh, the home parliaments miss barley mr code 
um, the citizens and the Euro home parliaments have voted. Thousand results were, were submitted. The main question was, should the EU move towards more mutual solidarity? The vote is clear. 97% generally want more European solidarity. The question is, of course, what does that mean? In what um, it does European solidarity manifest itself? So before discussing this, let's have a general look at the question. Um, um, Ms. Barley, Mr. Code, were you surprised by the large vote for more solidarity of the citizens? Maybe I should start now. Um, no, not really. I mean, I'm, I think we have to take into account that probably the pe people who respond to Pulse of Europe are in, in the tendons pro-Europeans, but still, even within pro-Europeans, it's not it's not always this notion of solidarity that they care about, or that is that is in the main focus. Uh, for some, it is also more a, a, a um, an economic question. So, so, um, but I think uh, the times of, of coronavirus are uh, are times where you see um, in a very clearly why we need solidarity and why the European Union is is the sphere where we can grant this solidarity. And I'm very happy that we do. Um, with the with the huge um, uh, fund that we are um, that we have put up financially, but also trying to coordinate um, what we're doing, considering, mm -hmm. for example, uh, vaccination, um, but also social rights. I think people people believe in that. So I was not really surprised. No. Okay. And um, as for you, Mr. Kohut. Mm -hmm. No, I was I was not surprised uh, by that vote. Um, I think that uh, the experience of of pandemia, as dreadful as it is, uh, has brought us uh, even more together in in the in the whole Europe. Uh, I think we re really realized that uh, without solidarity, uh, we are just weak. Uh, uh, that is not just a word. That is a, a real value, and I'm convinced that uh, Europe is ready to make the the leap uh, from economic community. Uh, to a community of, of solidarity. Uh, in some aspects, civil protection, for example, um, it already has. Of course, we had some problems uh, on, on, the, on the borders, for example, with trans-borders workers in the beginning of this, of this pandemic, but we also, uh, we, we, we kind of manage it and now it's much, much, much better. Okay, um, so it's time to have a closer look at the details revealed by um, the sub-question one in our House Parliament's debate. The question was, should wealthy uh, EU member states provide more economic support to member states that are particularly hard hit by, by crisis? Most home, home parliamentarians want EU countries to support each other economically in the event of a crisis, the wealthy to help the particularly crisis stricken. stricken. But the vote is no longer quite as clear cut as it was in general um, with a yes to European solidarity. Uh, on a scale of um, zero to 10, for strongly agree, the home parliamentarians voted a 7.4. Those in favor of support um, expect more cohesion and mutual trust, a common European self-image uh, and a greater ability to act together in a foreign policy. And um, they were convinced that everyone should benefit from financial uh, support because Europe would continue to develop, of course, and Europe as a whole would remain economically efficient. However, interesting uh, is many home parliaments expect conditions to be attached to economic aid. Uh, that the recipient countries should achieve clear goals that must be monitored transparently so that, um, for example, regional industry are promoted or structural reforms implemented. Um, let's talk about that. Uh, and here I would um, make a call for questions to the citizens. Um, dear citizens, if you have questions, please note them now in the chat. Um, and we'll collect them and I'll um, ask uh, one question to our politicians and afterwards uh, we'll rise up um, the uh, your questions. 
So, um, Ms. Bali and uh, Mr. Kahoot, in your opinion, does it make sense to attach conditions to economic support in a crisis? In a crisis? And what possibilities do you see for this political practice? What resistances and challenges do you see? Well, we have the experience of both ways. Uh, we have seen it uh, in the financial crisis, what, what happened uh, as, as we did. And um, I think the, the results were not really encouraging. Um, I mean, we have seen that um, if, if a country is in a, in, a, in a deep economic crisis and you implement reforms that slow down econ the economy even more, then that does not really have the effect that you want it to have. And um, I, I can say that, especially in Germany, this demand has always, be, already, um, always been quite strong um, to implement uh, reforms, uh, for example, in the pension systems, etc. cetera. But um, I, that's why I'm, I was very happy that this time in this crisis, Germany did not ask for these uh, conditions because First of all, it's a different crisis. It's, it's one that hits every country without anything that you could do about it. It's not nothing that it has been self, uh, um, that they're, they're, you can say this country is responsible for it. So I think it would not be appropriate uh, to, to, to put uh, conditions upon this. Um, and also, I think we have learned that it is more complex than, than just to say, oh, well, um, the uh, the Italians, uh, for example, go to uh, have a have a lower pension age. Uh, they should lift that before. On the other hand, the Italians didn't have a social security system like, for example, Germany had, and the pensionists in the family uh, cared for someone who was, for example, unemployed for a long time. So there there is a you can't just pick the one or the mm -hmm. other and then say this is better and this is worse and you have to change it and do it exactly like for example Germany or France or Italy or whoever. Um, so I think we have learned from the financial crisis yes you can put up conditions but that have to be um, rule of law. I think we will talk about that later. Yeah, later. You have to stick to the rules of the European Union, but we don't have to try to make every country the same. And I think that was a bit, bit the, the mistake that we made during the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to answer this question in a, in a yeah. I hope there will be yeah. more questions yeah. from there the participants. I'm sure maybe uh, Mr. Kohut um, first, and then we come to the questions of the audience. Well, in general, that's why we need uh, more federal uh, union in the future. That's that's for sure. That's that's very important for for for, for us. Uh, but I tend to agree with arguments uh, put forward in favor of such help. Uh, for one, uh, it strengthens cohesion and um, mutual trust, which in turn strengthens the European uh, Community ability to act in foreign policy. Uh, moreover, mutual solidarity is an obligation because. It fosters faith uh, in uh, the Euro European Union. Uh, further, both uh, donors and recipients of financial resources benefit. But I also see uh, an important counter argument. Uh, economic support uh, from the wealthy can uh, counteract structural reforms that are necessary in countries uh, that have been particularly hard hit by crisis. Um, in my opinion, economic support to member states uh, that are particularly hard hit by crisis should uh, be provided by the by the union, but this support must be targeted, uh, well allocated, uh, and it has to be transparent and linked to to the rule of law principle. But we will talk about it um, uh, later, as, 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 I, as I as I understand. Yeah, um, and also support should be rather given to regions uh, which are hit and not to the member states' uh, discretion. So let's jump, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, so let's jump to the questions um, from the citizens. Um, Peter, what is the yes. Yeah, I have one question from Estera Wozniak Prishelas uh, to Mr. Kohut. Um, and she asks, um, is it really the best way to simply economically support prosperous countries? Um, um, or is it, is it fair that prosperous countries support other countries uh, simply by transferring money or would it be better to help these countries uh, to 
uh, create a better situation versus just, you know, taking the money and trying to um, to run with it in a way, yes? Well, we, we don't we, do, we don't always have uh, proper tools to do it, uh, like uh, Estera Estera wrote. Uh, best regards to Estera from from Brussels. Uh, but the thing is that we have also possibilities to support, for example, uh, uh, NGOs directly or uh, self governments uh, directly in somehow in not of course in not uh, uh, not all all funds, but in some special funds like uh, rights and values. Now uh, the new uh, big fund from uh, from European Union. Uh, it's 1.6 uh, billion uh, euro, and uh, we will support directly uh, NGOs in in in, uh, in European countries. And I think it's it's a very good solution. Of course, it would be also good to to support uh, directly self governments, especially in this in, in these regions uh, which were uh, uh, hit uh, hard hit by by by, by pandemia. Uh, but and we are we are talking about it here also in in, in the chamber of the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that was one question related to the audience: who should get what money? Uh, I think what also was meant to um, is to uh, get a better understanding of what money makes sense in what context. Yeah. So um, and from your point of view, what is good? Uh, what is money good invested in countries? that are not as prosperous yeah why do you see it very uh, working very well yeah and helping and making a big leap well that that's what is the the, the rights and values program about it for example we are we want to support uh, uh, civil society in, in in all the european countries uh, we want to support also ngos which are supporting the the, the women's rights organizations uh, also, uh, in these countries that they have a problem with rule of law, we, are also, we will also we also want to support the uh, NGOs which are working on it. So, so yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the the, the direct uh, help for this kind of NGOs and for 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 people who are really uh, working uh, directly with with these uh, topics is 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 much better than uh, than to 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 the to the to the countries. Mm -hmm. I have another question, um, and this um, question is, um, how can reforms be supported um, by member states when they are not um, linked to conditions? I think one has to take into account, first of all, that, that um, money is not being given, you know, it's not like Poland gets uh, so many billion and, and France gets so many and Sweden gets so many, but it's it's in programs. So, so you get money, uh, for example, so much to um, to to foster your infrastructure in for trains and you get so much for supporting the independence of the judiciary and you get so much for um, student exchanges. So it's not that the, that the countries can do whatever they like with the money. Um, and this is being controlled also. I would like more mm -hmm. control on this, um, more, more measures that we can take also in the European Parliament if this is not being well spent. But there are systems in place to, 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 um, to guarantee that the money is being used for a certain purpose and a purpose that is of course in line with the European, first of all, with the European values, and then also with certain uh, programs. So, um, for example, if um, uh, if if you want to strengthen um, uh, social cohesion, if you want to uh, make life better for um, take whatever uh, single parents, and 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 you 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 have a program uh, for 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 this. Um, then of course this this is also part of a political program and as lucas said of course we are also supporting things that are um that are grassroots um within the country but you always have to see also that a lot of things are in national competence and it is not europe's um obligation or even possibility to influence everything. We, do, mm -hmm. we have no, for example, especially in tax questions, we do not have the possibility to, to influence that, even if we think that uh, things should go differently. So it is very complex, but we can use the money 
to support the aims that we think should be supported. That is what, what, uh, what we are right. doing. Okay, um, let's move on a bit. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Jan, um, uh, are there any video questions concerning this point? Or not for uh, the moment? No, no, no. Not, not at the moment, no. Okay, uh, then let's move on uh, to another um, aspect, um, which was very clear in the answers uh, of the home parliaments. Across all countries, many home parliaments are calling for economic support to be tied to principles of the rule of law. Last year, the discussion on the rule of law and fundamental European uh, values was a topic of conflict in the EU. Hungary and Poland rejected the rule of law mechanism and the compromise reached under the German Council presidency at the end of 2020 has been sharply criticized. Um, once again, a call for questions. Dear citizens, if you have questions, please, to this point, please note them in the chat. One little hin hint, um, uh, we want to discuss um, to these points and um, in the end you can uh, add um, questions um, general questions, um, but uh, this time um, in this webinar we want to discuss um, primarily uh, the uh, solidarity questions. So please be focused uh, on this subject. So Mr. Kohut, mm -hmm. Poland rejects the linking of funding um, to the rule of uh, law. Other European countries are very critical of this. How is this criticism perceived in Poland uh, itself that interests uh, us by its citizens? Justified or as an interference? And what do you think about it? Well, rule of, rule of law is a fundam fundamental principle of the, of the European Union. If citizens uh, cannot trust their judicial uh, systems, how can they trust the, uh, their rights are defended? Uh, how can business function uh, if the rule of law is not in place, how can the whole economic and social system perform well if there is no trust in uh, legal order? Uh, when we ask this question, uh, we see that uh, the fight for the rule of law uh, is the fight for the European project uh, in general. Uh, and uh, pro-democratic forces cannot lose the, uh, this fight. And let me, let me be clear, of course, Polish government was, was against this uh, mechanism, but 72% of Poles were for this mechanism. So it was, again, a, ba a battle between the, the government, which is not 100%, uh, uh, let's say, pro-democratic, and uh, civil society. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, of course, it is, it, is, it is also very important to, 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 to underline that the that, that government, um, uh, that Polish government violate the, the, uh, the rule of law, not, uh, not citizens. So, uh, that, that, that's, that's my answer. I have an additional question. How can citizens of other countries in Europe um, can support uh, the citizens in Poland on this question? Well, civil society as well. We, we don't have so many tools, but linking EU funds uh, to the rule of law uh, is uh, only one of the available tools uh, that we have in the parliament. And that's why we we kind of link the, the, the system to, to the rule of law mechanism. Uh, how can the other um, people from, from, the, from the other parts of Europe support um, yeah, Poles uh, in their, let's say, battle? Well, I think they can support the uh, NGOs which are fighting for the, for the democracy, which are fighting for the rule of law, which are fighting for the women's, uh, women's rights, for the LGBTQ, uh, uh, rights. Uh, there are there is a lot of um, NGOs uh, in Poland which are which are which are doing this this fight, like like Women's Strike, for example, the, the main one, the big one. And also, you can uh, support our um, support our independent uh, media's because uh, mm -hmm. the situation of public media's in Poland is very hard. Um, the propaganda is 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 is, is very 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 um, uh, very very hard, and we have a lot of. Um, independent uh, portals, independent uh, journalists, which which needs their uh, which needs support uh, nowadays. House of Europe, by the way, uh, just has begun to um, go this uh, way. We are supporting um, the uh, LGBTI movement with a campaign of Path of Europe and um, this LGBTI movement uh, movement in Poland. 
So, Ms. Bali, um, what um, do you think about tying the granting of economic, economic aid to rule of law? As I remember, you, fight, you were a severe um, advocate for, the, uh, for this linkage. Um, why is it necessary? What, and how do, do we want to reach it? Yes, it is absolutely ne necessary because uh, we have seen for the last 10 years uh, in Hungary and for the last five years in Poland that no other measures help, um, that we have authoritarian regimes who think that just because they have won the majority in an election, they are not longer tied to the fundamental principles of democracy. They, they, they misunderstand the rule of law as, as rule by law. They think just because they have the power to make rules, they can make all sorts of rules. But of course, you have fundamental values that you still have to respect. And they just do not acknowledge that. And you can, I mean, the European Union has been too, too, too soft on this. Um, Hans Timmermans tried, um, the vice president of the commission of the last term, also a social democrat, he really tried hard, which cost him the possibility to, be, to become commission president in the end, because Poland and Hungary, amongst other reasons, did not want him to do that. Um, but uh, apart from that, I mean, I don't want to make this a party political thing, uh, but I have to say that, uh, for example, the Hungar Hungarian, the Fidesz party is still part of the EPP, that the conservatives have never taken a strong stand there, that, for example, the CSU in Germany, the conservatives in, in Bavaria, they have invited Viktor Orban every single year since, until 2018 until two years ago, every single year to their party summits, to their conventions as a guest of honor. So we haven't done enough, especially in, in when you look at, at, at my home country. Um, and we, um, we see that, that we need new measures and finances is the only thing that can impress these governments. Mm -hmm. Poland and Hungary are two very different cases, or quite different cases. We, it's not the same by no means. In, in Hungary, it will be easier because Viktor Orban is so corrupt. I mean, he just takes all the money, not all, but a lot of money and puts it into the pockets of his son, his brother, his, uh, his, uh, his son-in-law, sorry, um, his, 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 uh, his best friend from school days. Um, so it is very easy to get him with the money. In Poland, it will be a bit more difficult because the regi regime is more ideological. But still, they depend also on European money and you can't be part of the game, um, of the European game and, and take everything you can get and not apply the rules. So we have to make this clear. Um, and I'm, I'm, if I might say, might say another one sentence, in Poland, um, it has become clear why the rule of law is so important. For a lot of people, this is very abstract. What is the rule of law, independence of judiciary? What, is, what does that have to do with my life? And now we have the discussion about abortion in Poland and people see what happens if you do not have an independent court, uh, constitutional court, then they do not rule by the law, then they rule by what the ruling party wants. Mm -hmm. And this is where they see and why the polls have also sl uh, slipped in, in Poland um, against the ruling party, because they now see that it has really direct consequences, can have direct consequences on your personal life. Peter, are there any questions um, from the citizens? Yes, there are questions, lots of questions about rule of law. That's definitely the thing that, that is moving the people here. Um, <laughs> and there's one specific question to Mr. Kohut, because um, it is understood that obviously many Polish people don't like the, the, the position of the government when it comes to rule of law. And probably the Polish are the most European friendly citizens of Europe, I, I'd say, from, from service, yeah. But is it, um, why, why are then so, still so many people um, voting for the, for the current government, for the PIS party, when, when so many people are so pro-European? Well, in this case, I totally agree with Katarina, uh, because the rule of law and the, the theoretic uh, things, they, they were a bit abstract for the people. And after the, the, the abortion case, after the, what happened last uh, November in Poland, people uh, found that th there is a problem with uh, 
with with uh, with with judiciary system, uh, with uh, human rights, uh, and in general, to be honest, I'm an optimist. I think that uh, the civil society will kind of push uh, the government, uh, maybe not in spring, but maybe in the end of, of of spring, maybe in the middle of the year, there will be another pro probably protest. I'm sure that they they that they accepted the the budget and the uh, next generation EU uh, found only because that that, that they had polls that that, uh, that 72 polls uh, were for the rule of rule mechanism that 87 per, per percent of people are uh, pro europeans in in poland if if the if the if the polls would be different i'm sure there would be a an ideologic war with with the european union as uh, katarina uh, mentioned so in general i am an optimist and i i, I saw people on the streets uh, in november uh, and in in december because of, of, of women's uh, women's right, uh, women's rights uh, strikes uh, and th th this protests were in the beginning connected with, with women's rights but then it, they, they were also uh, anti-government protests so uh, of course now we have a very difficult times we have a pandemic uh, we have problems with with you know with uh, with kind of uh, protest because of the of the lack of, of possibility to, to, to protest but in my opinion uh, it will it will be uh, it will be a very um, interesting spring uh, in Poland uh, because people will get. Uh, uh, I think they, they will start to protest more and more. Also because of the of the of the spring, because of the of the New Year's, uh, you know, uh, energy. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, that the law and justice government already knows it that they are in trouble. So, um, I see there is a question from Sylvia, and I was wondering whether we can get her into the discussion here via video. Uh, Jan, do you, do you see a chance that we ask her? She should be able to talk um, already. Um, yeah. Um, and she would have to activate her, 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 the video herself. Okay. So, Sylvia, do you want to join? So obviously, obviously, she has a question related to financial solidarity um, and uh, whether financial solidarity can contradict the national budgetary law. Yeah, um, because she thinks that from her point of view, we are not re re united as Europeans uh, from a, a fiscal point of view, fiscal law point of view. So, um, any thoughts about this one? Well, I already mentioned that the European Union does not have uh, have a, uh, an original competence for for a fiscal law, which of course. Is is for us a problem when it comes to solidarity because it is of course not um, solidar at all to to um, to undermine your fellow member states um, the tax policy by putting on very very dumping taxes so to say and this has always been a problem in the European Union and uh, but as long as we don't have European competence this will be difficult. But what we can do and what we what we actually do is to find intergovernmental solutions. And for example, we are working, we have been working, especially we as, as social democrats on, on the financial transaction tax for a long time, which means that not only when you go to your bakery and buy your bread, you pay uh, a tax on an added value tax. And, and uh, but that you also have to pay such a tax for for um, shares and 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 options uh, in in the in a in a fin on the financial market because there you don't have such taxes in in most of the member states. So um, so this is something that we would like to introduce, um, and we will hopefully do this now with uh, with a number of. Of member states who agreed on this, I think they were nine or ten. I'm, I'm not really sure at the moment. So, so, but this is then not not something that is not a European law. 
otherwise it would apply to all 27 member states. It's something that several governments, several member states agree to do by themselves and then one can one can try to enlarge this. Uh, that is something that we can do and it is absolutely in line with the national laws. Of course, there you have to change, uh, you have to change it, adjust it uh, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So do we have a, a, a live um, um, statement from someone who wants to join via video as well? Jan? Yes, uh, we have a statement from, um, excuse me if I don't spell the name right, Pavel Jankiewicz. Um, yes. And I'll bring you into the conversation now. Very good. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, audible. Uh, uh, yes, you are. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to see you in this formula uh, with Lukas Kohut. I'm a member of Dazen Berlin. I was exchanging some messages also on Messenger because of the trans um, trans border uh, cases of Polish workers and about the Euro region. So I can confirm that Lukas Kohut is accessible to the grassroots activists. Uh, with uh, Ms. Bali, I, I was uh, I was a bartender in the Amano Hotel in Berlin. I was serving at your birthday, I remember once. <laughs> it was also nice to see you in this formula. And I have a question. Uh, I, was, I have a question about the rule of law and a uh, certain example from my personal experience, what it comes down to uh, when it gets nasty. Uh, this uh, holiday this summer, I was stopped in Bulgaria by a Bulgarian policeman who uh, who took our IDs uh, to control it, and then he left it. Uh, he left the the site somewhere. He wanted to go into some civil car, passed these documents to some civil dressed gentleman. So we started to protest because we couldn't lose our documents um, from our site. We understood that it's not okay. We didn't see any IDs of those gentlemen, and, and that was uh, worrying. So I started to record uh, the situation, which annoyed the policeman to the extent that I spent 24 hours in the Bulgarian jail, because he said it's not allowed, which is actually not true, but he actually, he, I still have a case in Bulgaria. But my point is that I was with other boy who, uh, I finished law myself. Uh, I have set an air of, I don't know, I, I'm not shy with in the, those uh, situations, maybe because of the education. But there was a, a guy with me who um, had more like working class appearance, who was just, uh, you know, guy um, dressing those hip hop uh, dress. And then they treated him much, he was Bulgarian, by the way, I was Polish, but it, they treated him much, much worse than, than me. It was the same situation. He was stopped at the same time. But for example, they asked him to put his pants down, bend over and show if he's not hiding something in his ass, sorry to say. So when the things get nasty, it is the middle classes and the educated people that march in defense of the rule of law. But it's, if it's really dismantled and the things are getting really corrupt, and they told this guy actually that uh, he, uh, they know uh, someone in his hometown. So it was some kind of forcing. The, the working class and the lower class people are much, treated much, much worse. And that's my question. Is the European uh, Union um, to show its kind of uh, support also for those people without so much of social capital uh, to thank kind of you break this image. I'm sorry to interrupt you a bit, Pavel. Uh, thank you very much for your question, but we have to move on and I'll give this question to our politi political guests. Would you like to answer? Thank you very much, Pavel. No, I thank you very much. I don't know who wants to start. Uh, if you don't move, Lukas, I, I just do. Um, well, I mean, we are social democrats, so we we are per definition, and that's why we do this, uh, because we want to represent the people who are, um, who have less, um, 
I wouldn't even say less opportunities, but who have who have a, a different start in life and to help them to have the same rights and, and possibilities as as, as uh, anyone else. So, so, of course, if you ask, are we going to support this? We, of course, say yes, and we do it. But I'm not really sure if I agree on your on your um, hypothesis, to be honest, because um, the people who are in trouble when it comes to the rule of law are the ones who um, who stand up against uh, against the mighty, against the, the ones who are in power. Those are the ones who suffer the most. And that can be very, very different type of people. This does not depend on an economical background. Um, it can be it can be workers. Um, I mean, in Poland, the, the Solidarność movement was a workers' movement. Um, but it can be intellectuals. It can be it can be um, artists. Very often, it's 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 also a cultural thing. Uh, so it's very, very different people who, who are being oppressed because they are dangerous for the ones who abuse powers. And, and we stand behind every single one of them and try to protect every single one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, everyone who is in danger because of, also because of identity. I mean, the LGBTI uh, people, for example, everyone who is, who is being oppressed. Yeah. So, so we don't make a difference there, I would say. So I would like to move on a bit faster because um, the, the time is running out. Um, so uh, let's uh, turn to question two, uh, the sub question two in the home parliament um, session. Um, social uh, inequality in the EU has been growing enormously since the, the financial crisis. Therefore, we ask, should the EU invest more in social policy measures to tackle social inequality between member states. This was the point on which the home parliaments were least in agreement. The average score on the scale is 6.4. One third of HPs see the EU as an economic community, but nearly half would like to see it um, to develop into a social union. The most common reason, common social policy measures would create a Euro European sense of community and cohesion. Some hope that harmonization of social systems will reduce migration um, between European countries as well. But counter uh, arguments, arguments also weighted heavily. A European social policy would not even be possible, they argued, because of differences in social security systems and cultural backgrounds. It would have to fail. Some parliamentarians think it's too expensive and uh, at least up to the states, not to the EU, to provide social security for the populations. So, um, Ms. Barley, you have a commit, you are a committed advocate um, of a European social policy, a minimum European minimum wage and a social market economy in Europe. And I think you, Mr. Kohut, as well. How can that work and how do you want to implement it? Uh, Maybe it's Mr. Kohut. Yes, now, yes a, common, a common European social policy desir is desirable. Um, and, uh, and I will say more, not only member states, uh, regions as well. Uh, for example, many, many of them, like, like my Silesia, are trans-border regions and uh, uh, they are economic uh, entities and suffer because of a lack of common European social policy. Uh, let's take the case of trans-border workers that Pavel mentioned before. Uh, I know the problem very well. Uh, I was one of them uh, uh, at some point uh, before. Uh, so definitely we should take some st steps here, starting with harmonization of, of insurance uh, and minimum wage. Uh, and that's why we also, pr probably me and Katarina are in social, socialists and democrats, uh, because we are kind of, uh, we started this discussion in, 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 in the parliament and we are working on it. Maybe, maybe one can add that it is also at the heart of the European Union. It is, it is not so much known, but if you read the Schuman Declaration, we just, we just celebrated the, the 70th anniversary. If you read that, um, the, the European Union was not only founded to, to link uh, economies so that we will not have war against each other ever again. It was also um, to improve actually workers' rights in, in these areas of coal and steel where it all started off. 
And it is, it is in there, it is in the Schumann Declaration. And it has far too long been a, a purely economic thing, this European Union. And, and how can that work? I mean, how can you say this is an economic sphere and leave out the rights of people, especially workers? How, does, how shall that work? And it's just wrong to say that this will cost money. That is always what the conservatives say. Oh, we can't, we can't afford this. Take the minimum wage. This does not cost. It's not that German German taxpayers will 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 send lots of money to Romania so that their when minimum wage can be paid. It is that we put up rules. It's not more than that. We just want to put up rules that every country, every member state, has to grant a minimum wage in a certain percentage of the of the average wage not not the same everywhere not 12 or 15 euros everywhere of course not but say 60 percent of the average wage or 70 or 50 or whatever has to be paid that doesn't cost any other member state any other uh, any euro not, not one single euro but it leaves the same setting for everyone and that is just fair especially in a in a, in a homogene uh, economic sphere where do you see the, the, the most severe obstacles to implement these ideas? A lot of governments just don't want it. I mean, the conservatively rules, ruled <laughs> countries, they just don't want it because they, they, I mean, we have minimum wages in almost every, every member state, but they're in, in a lot of countries not high enough, like in Germany. Um, and, and of course, people think, yeah, it's good for the economy if you have cheap workers. But you, you, you mentioned migration. European migration is not bad at all. We want people to have the freedom to move. Uh, this is part of our, our civil liberties, of, of, the, of the core identity of the European Union. But we don't want people to have to leave their country. And if you talk especially to Polish people, to Hungarian people, they say a whole generation, it's worse in Hungary than in Poland, but a whole generation of young, especially women, is leaving our country to to care for your elderly people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have to leave because they there are regions where they don't find jobs and then you have the kids that grow up with the grandparents they they should not be forced to leave they should be able to leave if they want to but they should not be forced to leave mm -hmm. i totally i totally agree i was i was one of them i was uh, when i was when i was finishing my studies i was uh, you know looking for a job in other countries uh, of the European Union because of the situation of economic situation. That's why I, I worked in, in Germany, Sweden, Norway, Czech Republic and Philippines. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I totally agree with, with, with Katerina. Um, but also there is, a, there, is a, there is a problem now that people are, are moving from, from countries to countries because of the, 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 the lack of rule of law. That's, that's, the, the, that's, an, that's another case. Yeah. Peter, do we have um, any questions from the citizens? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, when you raise the question, should the EU invest more in social policy measures to counteract social inequality between member states? Most people or many people come up with the differences between the member states, the economical differences, the cultural differences, the differences in social security assistance. Yeah. So and and that is that is obviously a topic. Um, which makes people think like, how does it go together? Yeah, if we invest in these measures, but but the systems are so differently, can it work? Yeah. So what what would be your reaction, Katarina Bali and Lukas Kohut? Concrete. Next. Step. Go ahead, Lukas. Well, we need to start this, this discussion in the in the in the European Union, and uh, that's why we also st we, we will start the, the the conference of the future of Europe in the in the. Uh, in 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 few years uh, time because it it is a good uh, time now to start a discussion about the federalization of europe also because of the pandemic also because of that uh, what happened uh, in 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 last year uh, but we have to we have to we have to kind of start to talk about we have to start the discussion and it it is good that we have platforms like like yours to start this discussion online because maybe when people will know about this plans that that maybe they will be uh, uh, they will be vote for it in the future. And we have to, we have to, we should tell them that we respect the differences, but we don't want to make every system alike. Definitely not. But then you have to respect the differences always. Take the example again, financial crisis. You have Greece, where you have 
the elderly who, who with their pension provide for the family if someone is unemployed. You do not have a long long term um, support for people who do not have, have a job. Mm -hmm. So the, you have the elderly. Now in the financial crisis, the European Union told, the, told Greece to cut these pensions, but they did, did not introduce uh, a, an unemployment scheme. So you cannot on the one hand say, um, well, it's also different than how should this work? But there where you, but then intervene on, in a point and, and really destroy the, their whole system. You know, you can't have both. And I think you should respect the, the system that they have, but say you have to grant something. You have to grant a decent living. How you do that? It's your, it's, it's your affair. You can do it in different ways, like the minimum wage. The Nordic countries will have strong trade unions and, and employers uh, institutions. They, they will have a different regime than other countries, which is fine, as long as the result is protection for every single European citizen. Okay, so thank you very much. And let's come to the third and uh, the last uh, sub-question, number, number three. Um, the third question in our home parliaments was remarkably non-controversial. Should the EU, in the interest of future generations, primarily focus on environmentally friendly innovation and jobs? On average, particip participants choose 8.9. It's an enormous support. The citizens so, want a quick change towards sustainability in order to minimize negative impacts and the cost of the necessary transformation for the Earth, Earth societies and democracy. Uh, only about one fifth of all home parliaments had reservations about strong focus on uh, environmental sustainability because they fear that states that have a lot of uh, CO2 intensive industry will be left behind. Uh, to, uh, they would they want to avoid unemployment and social ten tensions and uh, so um, politicians must act urgently but so far the green deal is not much more than an empty phrase some people say how do you intend to move sustainability forward concretely um, and what concrete measures do you want to tackle first um, and don't forget to call for questions, dear citizens. Um, if you have questions for this topic, please note them in the chat. And then to our politicians, I already asked my question. Do you want to start, Lucas? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can start this time. Uh, well, we have an, ar an urgent call uh, for action, uh, for more investment in climate protection, for sure. Uh, it is not a matter uh, if uh, and when, but how now. Uh, sustainable change not only preserves jobs and social systems, but also increases the uh, European Union's uh, competitiveness. Um, and in the spirit of the Green Deal, uh, financial resources uh, should be used now in a sustainable way to avoid placing uh, an excessive burden uh, on future generations. Uh, uh, I, can, I can also say that uh, there is, of course, a, a, a resistance uh, lies with, with mentality uh, because we kind of feel safe with uh, what we know um, and we don't want to be alone when the change uh, happens. Uh, I can say it in my Silesia. Uh, miners are um, not afraid of decarbonization. And they, they are afraid that they will be uh, left alone with, uh, with this transition, uh, that they will be left uh, behind. Uh, so we need to make sure that they are not alone, uh, but they probably know it. Uh, just transition uh, mechanism uh, together with the Just Transition Fund is, is considerable amount of money uh, for them and for the, for the whole regions. Uh, I was working on it in, uh, in the ITRE committee uh, before, uh, and uh, it has to be complemented with money uh, from national budgets. Uh, that, is, that is obvious. Uh, but let us, let us not forget that, 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 that the energy transition means savings. All the funds that we, uh, all, all the funds that we spend now because of the trans transformation, 
uh, and also because of environmental damage uh, and increased healthcare because of coal uh, related diseases. Uh, so uh, last, last but not least, the transition is a transition from, um, but is but is also a transition to, and we are transi transiting towards a green energy, uh, and there will be a lot of workplaces there as well in the future. Uh, we already have, we, we already start this uh, transition uh, plan uh, in in my region, and I think uh, I think it will succeed. It. Yeah, and uh, thank you for your um, answer. And we have uh, Andre Langwurst uh, in our conversation now, who raised a couple of very interesting questions in regards to this Green Deal theme. So, Andre, um, can you hear us? And can you unmute yourself and maybe make yourself seen? Yes. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I don't know if you can see my uh, my video. Uh, it switched on, Not but. Yet. Yeah. Can you switch it on? Let, let me check if I, if I can do that. Um, but I know, well, we shouldn't waste too much time on that. So thank you very much uh, for, for taking me. So uh, I'm here in France uh, right now and then heading a part of Europe in, in Annecy. By the way, that has been stimulated by uh, my hometown, which is Celle in, in uh, close to Hanover. Uh, where there had been a very active uh, part of Europe team and that inspired me that much that I said, well, we need to have that in France and just before the European elections in, in uh, um, um, the, the last European elections, I, I created part of Europe in, in, in France because my fear was as well that the, um, uh, the, the Front National going to be uh, uh, too important and uh, as a matter of fact, unfortunately, it's right now the, the most important uh, uh, representation of uh, French politicians in European Parliament. But coming back to the Green Deal, um, uh, I've got as well another hat. Uh, I mean, first, I'm a French-German lawyer based uh, um, uh, um, heavily involved in renewable energies. And I've got as well the, the head as a secretary general of European Solar Manufacturing Council. And as such, I realize as well, um, we, we are missing a, a real European strategy for renewables uh, and as well as transnational strategy um, and some, some support mechanisms. And when you have... Uh, um, uh, had a look at what the European Commission particularly um, mentions. Uh, they would like, to, they say everything is fine, Green Deal is great, um, uh, we need to go for green hydrogen and we need to do that by offshore uh, whatever, even offshore solar. And if you ask the solar specialists, um, well, they, they have no clue what they really want to talk about. Um, but we have with solar uh, PV, we have well, one of the cheapest energies and we need to push this as well for Poland. Uh, I mean, you, I, I've lived and, and started in Krakow, wonderful city, but just outside the, uh, the city you have Nova Huta. Uh, and that has as well enormous uh, ecologic and hen environmental um, and health impact. Um, uh, moreover, I mean, if you go to Spain, if you go to Greece, they spend an awful lot of money for non-renewable energies. Um, so we need to concentrate that money um, uh, for the countries and we need to rebuild as well this industry. But so far, lots of pol European politicians say, yes, the Chinese, they are so cheap, we have no chance. But if you ask Claude Thomas, for example, who's really one of the front runners uh, for renewable energies in the European Parliament, now minister in, in Luxembourg, but well, we still have the chance. And we should not forget every euro we invest uh, into uh, European products means European jobs. Andre, please come to your question. The question is, what do you think, and, and here I'm talking particularly to, to Lukas, um, uh, shall we do uh, to support coal areas like, like Poland so that they're going to build up a, a new uh, renewable energy industry? And what is needed as well on, you, on a European level to push for a real European energy strategy? So far, it is every country for itself. We, def we definitely should support uh, coal regions uh, like Silesia, like uh, uh, you mentioned that you, you lived in Krakow, so you know what is the, the situation with, with, with air pollution in, in Krakow area. Believe me, in my hometown in Rednik is even worse. I think it's the worst, uh, the, the most polluted city in the, in the, in the whole Europe now. Uh, so this is a very big need because people are dying of, uh, because of, of diseases, uh, of, of, of cancers, you know. So I definitely, I am also here uh, in ITRE committee, even if I'm a humanist and I, I was not, uh, I'm not an engineer, I, I'm here in the ITRE committee also to, 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 to get uh, more money for the, for the transformation, for the 
uh, energy transformation for, for Silesia and for the, for the whole Poland. And we, we achieved a good amount of money um, and before the, the, in, in July before the, the council meeting uh, for, the, for, the, for the just transition fund. Unfortunately, the council has changed the budget for the transfer, transformation. Uh, and that this is a big problem, huge problem for the not only for Silesia but for the whole whole Poland because we have 87 percent of, of of energy from coal still in 2021. So imagine the scale of the of the problem, uh, and that's why I'm here. I I, I definitely uh, aiming for the for the renewable um, uh, workplaces in the future, in, especially in Silesia, in places where people will lose uh, their jobs. Uh, but it, it is very hard because of the situation with Polish government, firstly. Secondly, because of the, the, the amount of money that we need is, is much higher than even the whole uh, just transition mechanism. So uh, it is a big, big challenge. Hey, Mrs. Bali, um, how could we, how, how would you like to overcome the, um, the resistances um, uh, in the political system against um, quick changes um, in direction to more uh, sustainability? Well, one has to say, and Lucas already mentioned it, that, uh, that the parliament is much more progressive in this respect uh, than the council or the, or the commission. Um, we also voted for 60% uh, uh, CO2 reduction until 2030 and not only for 55. Um, so we are far more ambitious uh, and, and so we need the support by the population. I think this is very, very important. Of course, now with the pandemic, people cannot uh, go to the streets anymore, but this has, has helped very, very much um, also in our parliamentarian discussions and decisions because it creates pressure. And then, yes, we, it's, it's like Lucas said, we have to, we have to, um, we have to take away the fear uh, that that there will be areas um, that, that will lose. I mean, there, we will have areas that will change, definitely. And, and we have examples all over Europe. We have it in Germany with the Ruhrgebiet and, and everywhere. We already have transition regions. We've had them in the last decades already. So it, it is feasible, but it costs money, it costs time. And it costs um, especially conviction by the political responsibles. And I must, I must add one point when it comes to energy. We, the danger is, for me, it's a danger that we then move again to nuclear energy. And I would see this as a completely wrong path, as, but it's CO2 neutral. So we, we have to be very careful not to replace one problem by, by another. But what we really need is, is public support because the European Parliament is pushing well. Thank you very much. Um, this was the uh, third um, uh, set of questions um, from our home parliaments. We still have um, uh, many questions in the chat and we suggest to send these questions to you, Mr. Kurt, and with you, Mrs. Bali. And um, if possible, it would be great if you could answer them because um, I think the participants are very interested um, of, uh, in, uh, in an, an exchange. Um, now we want to come to an end um, with some closing um, questions about the future of the cooperation of, of politics and civil society, because this is uh, that's what's uh, what we are talking about, or why we are talking um, today. Um, uh, it's um, obvious that uh, many forms of new party participation participa for citizens are emerging everywhere in Europe in Ireland, in France, and soon the citizens councils in Germany will raise. And um, so um, the systems are looking for more, um, for, for a various number of forms to, um, to, to push the dialogue between um, uh, citizens um, and the politics. Um, uh, in the end, um, uh, we are interesting uh, uh, in your advice. How can you integrate uh, these ideas of the uh, citizens into your everyday life as a uh, in political business? What um, what would be what can we make better? Do you need even more concrete um, uh, questions or ideas? 
Um, and um, we have, what do you think about this? Maybe you can give us some, some inspirations. Um, well, what we need is, is more um, dialogues like this, uh, like this one, because, uh, and I'm very grateful for this, because what we have very much is input. We get input from almost everywhere. We get, we get emails, we get, we get mm -hmm. brochures, we get everything. But what we have too, too little is, is a dialogue where, where if someone gives a, a, a contribution, then we can maybe ask back how do you how do you see that and and, and how concretely sh yes how, how should that, that look concretely or that we can say this is very difficult because and then you can have a reaction mm -hmm. this is really what we need um and if i may if i may uh, also have a have a wish what we really need to do is is include the entire population very often we see only a, a, a part of society integrating in this in, in this kind of dialogue it's the well-informed it's the well-educated um and and we need really everyone to 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 engage and um i know that parts of europe wants to be that and, and do exactly that and I, I would like to support you in anything that that you do to 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 include those who are not so likely to participate thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Code. I think I think education education is vital for everything. Uh, civil education, uh, also uh, all this all this European program, which are very very important. Erasmus, Horizon. Uh, I was taking part in Erasmus. That's why I'm probably the member of the European Parliament. You know, it is very good to see the the, the countries from to see your country from another perspective, uh, wide angled. You know, uh, I can say as a photographer. Uh, it is very important for everyone, and I think we should definitely uh, uh, support these this, this programs. Of course, uh, we were progressive uh, uh, enough, uh, let's say, uh, as Katarina mentioned before, but of course Council cut a bit uh, uh, Erasmus program as well. Uh, so we are, we are fighting for the, for the, for the civil um, society in the European Parliament, because they, can, they cannot be a democracy without uh, civil so society, that's for sure. Poland is a good example. We, we still have a democracy because we have a, a civil society, uh, and and that's 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 the key. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, last question uh, for both of you. In her welcome address to the third round of the Home Parliaments, Commission President von der Leyen reminded the audience that in the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, which the European Parliament, the Council of Commission plan to launch soon initiatives such as the Home Parliaments are also to co contribute their ideas to the work of the conference. Ms. Bali, Mr. Kahoot, um, how can the, house, uh, the Home Parliaments best contribute their ideas to the conference um, of the future of, of Europe? What can we do to be heard? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have still not really an idea how the conference on the future of Europe will look like. We are very, very unhappy with this because also there the European Parliament across the political parties is pushing very much for this conference. And we wanted really to be something where real people, not only selected ones, um, real people engage in a real pro process that leads to real results. And we have to we have to admit that obviously the council and the commission are not so enthusiastic of, uh, about a real participation. So it is very difficult to say now what Pulse of Europe can do concretely. But when it comes to this conference, um, it it will be something that that um, where we will be definitely very happy to have multipliers, I don't know if that is a, a, an English word, but if we ha already have organizations that that can spread um, not only the information within the public, but to also the feedback back to us. And there, of course, you, you are what you're doing with the Home Parliament is, is exactly what we need, exactly precisely what we need. And I hope that uh, that we will find possibilities to include individuals, but also organizations like yours, we will definitely fight for that. Okay, 
So thank you very much for this lively discussion to all of the participants, uh, to our wonderful guests, Katerina Bali and Lukas Kohut, to all the people uh, uh, out there uh, on, the, uh, on their screens who sent us questions and uh, took part in their discussions as promised. Um, we will. Uh, we are going to send um, the uh, questions we've got to Mr. Kurt and Ms. Bali, and I would like to remind you um, of the dates for the next discussions with European politicians. Um, the next one uh, will be with um, Manfred Weber and Otmar Karas uh, of the EPP. Uh, on um, the 11th um, January and for the rest of um, the dates please have a look uh, uh, on our website um, homeparliaments.de and so thank you very much but uh, in the end uh, finally um, today we want to take